based on science. Hey everyone, Matt Thomas here. Thanks for watching. So over the past five years, I've researched, recorded, and sent out over 100 videos highlighting the best teaching strategies based on neuroscience and behavioral psychology. And the comment that I get the most, no joke, is, hey Matt, great, we love these, thank you so much. I've saved your emails so that I can watch the videos later when I have time. And then when I'll, when I'll you know, see teachers, they'll say, ah, I still got like a few videos to watch, I've got them saved. And so it tells me, you know, time is something teachers don't really have a lot of. So what I've decided to do is record a video series called The Answers. So essentially every video, my hope is to be under five minutes. It's essentially going to give you just the answers without going into uh, the studies, the research, without uh, a lot of my commentary. It's literally just going to be for the teachers are like, look, Matt, we love the research. We trust it. J just give us the answers. Can you just tell us what the end result is? So that's what this is for. Also within these slides, I have linked the much longer videos that go into the research that has my personal commentary. Um, the, but, but the point of this series is, hey, we got five minutes to listen to this. Can you just give us the answers? So that's what this is going to be. Here's part one, uh, and I'll have broken this up into multiple parts. Here we go. So the first one is how the brain really learns. And this is important to know because this pretty much explains why any of us do what we do. It explains why our students act a certain way in class. It explains why a, a student will like a certain class over another class or like a certain teacher over another teacher. Uh, and it pretty much comes down to this. Each time we experience something, our brain will make a prediction as to what is about to happen, right? It predicts the outcome. And it, it does that based on our previous experience. Uh, and what it'll do is based on what we've experienced previously, our brain will give us a combination of neuromodulars and we interpret that as feelings. So ultimately, if you have a student that has not had a good experience in math class, before they come into class, the brain is going to predict that this is not going to go well and we need to protect ourselves. And so the brain will send the person a combination of neuromodulators and they will probably come into class not feeling very good. Um, on the other side, if a, if a person had had a great experience with a teacher or with a class, the brain is going to predict that that experience through the day is going to be great. They're going to love that class and, and um, that student will come to class feeling good, feeling ready to learn. The reason this is so important to know is as a teacher, you have so much influence over how the students are going to experience your class or if they're going to enjoy your class or if they're going to learn uh, 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 effectively in your class. Because every interaction we have on our students or with our students is an opportunity to confirm or change a prediction. So if you've had a, a, a student who previously has not had a great experience with math, you have the opportunity to make that a great class by teaching with engaging strategies, making the student feel good in class, making them feel value. So just understanding how the brain learns is so very important because what'll happen is this, the brain hates to be wrong about its predictions. So if the brain is predicting that this student will not have a great experience in class, but you're teaching this student in such a great, great, great way that they're really enjoying the class, the brain was wrong about its prediction. And anytime a brain is wrong about a prediction, that's called learning. And that will change how the brain thinks uh, 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 in the future regarding you know, uh, coming to the class. That's brain plasticity. Anytime uh, uh, the brain is wrong about a prediction and it starts to change its way of thinking, that's brain plasticity. So from then on, the person who did, didn't think they were going to have a great experience in class will start believing that they can do well in class because they really enjoy that class. So please know that every interaction you have with the person is an opportunity to either confirm a prediction that they have or change a prediction depending on their experience. So the next thing is how the brain remembers. And essentially the brain will only remember something if it finds the value in what it's learning and if it finds a way that it can apply it to its real world. So essentially it, it works like this. Whenever a person learns something, a neural pathway is created in their brain. If the, the, the person cannot find value in that, the brain is going to start forgetting the information, essentially deleting the information, usually within 24 hours. So if you want the students to remember the information you're teaching, make sure that you are reteaching it and not just over a few day period of time, right? Throughout your lessons, throughout the year, take that information and, and, and reapply it somewhere. Show the students the value uh, and how they can apply it in the real world. Create some type of project for them to be able to apply that information. Teach 
with patterns, the brain loves to be very efficient, so it remembers patterns very easily, which is why uh, if, you're, if you're teaching essays, uh, uh, constantly going over uh, the pattern of writing is, makes it easier for the brain to remember. Um, if you're uh, using rap, rap is a great way to have people remember things because the brain likes that pattern of music. Uh, following along with the less is more theory in education, um, don't feel like you have to teach everything. Focus on the most important things and have the students master it. If you're teaching a math lesson, don't feel like you have to do every single step of the of the uh, problem uh, uh, all at once. Do little bits and pieces. Have the students work on those independently or, or individually before moving on. So you don't want the brain to start deleting the information within 24 hours. And that's what will happen if the brain doesn't find the information valuable. So next is what is the most effective seating arrangement for your class? So I looked at rows versus clusters or table groups, if you like, and U-shaped. And what I did was, uh, first of all, I haven't recorded the full video yet. So I will link the full video to this uh, slideshow as soon as I have recorded the full video. I'll just give you the, the, the quick uh, uh, answers to it. Essentially, I looked, at the I looked at multiple studies within these documents. There were multiple studies within those. Um, and I looked at, I didn't look at quotes. I looked at documents that only had studies that that were done, not people's opinions about this. So what the studies generally all came to the conclusion of this, the choice of seating arrangement should align with specific instructional goals to optimize learning outcomes. Essentially, the way you should arrange your class is based on what you're doing. It's based on what you're trying to accomplish, what your goals are. So quickly, in rows, generally, you want to have your students in rows if they're doing individual tasks. If they're focusing more on logical reasoning, rows showed more improved on-task behavior. Define that however you will. Uh, and also with rows, the quantity of individual work improved without sacrificing quality. Um, and when it came to cluster seating, there was more of a beneficial for brainstorming, interaction, group work, and, and questioning the teacher. Uh, it was more beneficial to have them in clusters for students who who uh, define themselves as as lonely or students that were not used to being alone. It's better to have them in clusters. Uh, the one thing, uh, clusters did not always correlate with improved academic achievement. So ultimately, the way I would do it in my class is I would always keep my students in rows and then teach them to quickly transition into pairs or higher number of group members. It just, it was, it was better for me at the beginning of the year, I would teach them how to quickly move into the, to, to the, uh, the groups um, and just spend a few seconds doing it. Um, okay, final one in this video. I want for each video, I want to talk about a, a learning myth. I, I want to break a learning myth that's out there. Um, and there's this there's this idea that you have to repeat something seven times to have it be locked in the brain, and that's a learning myth. You depending on your uh, prior experience and the context of what you're learning, you can learn something immediately. Or you could memorize something a thousand times and still never learn it. So try not to buy into the seven times to remember learning myth. Really just focus on whatever you're teaching. Make sure the students find it valuable. Try to apply it to something that they can use in the real world. Thanks for watching.